Fatima. I was a, a small person in a very, very big project team. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of colleagues as well today. And I am going to have to refer to my notes quite a lot because there are quite a lot of moving parts in this project. So to begin with, um, I thought it would just be useful to give you a little bit of a background to who Historic Environment Scotland, better known as HESS, are. Um, so HESS was born out of the merging of Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission for the Ancient and Historic Monuments of Scotland in 2015. Uh, we were established as the lead public body to investigate, care for and promote Scotland's historic environment. So we're a non-departmental public body, which means that we have a role in the processes of national government, but we are not a government department. But we do regularly report to Scottish ministers and we receive funding from Scottish government, though we do also generate our own income. Uh, in terms of numbers, we manage 336 sites of historic uh, significance and Edinburgh Castle is probably the most famous of those. We hold an aerial photography collection of about 20 million items, an archive collection of 5 million items and an object collection of around 42,000 items. We oversee a multi-million pound grants programme, carry out survey recording and listing work and we provide technical advice on Scotland's built heritage. Um, so quite often when I come along to conferences, a lot of people are quite surprised that Historic Environment Scotland have collections. So I thought it would also be useful if I gave a little bit of a background on that as well. Um, so I've already said you've got 42,000 objects and those are from 148 of those 336 historic sites that we look after. Um, our ethos is to keep the collections at the sites that they're associated with as much as possible. And this means that the collections themselves are dispersed all over Scotland. So from Shetland down to Dumfries and in most places in between. Um, we have about 48% of our collection on public display and we have two large, though not large enough, storage facilities in Edinburgh. We're a team of 33 made up largely of collections, management, documentation and conservation roles. And most of us are based in Edinburgh, but we travel all over the country to deliver various work programmes. Um, we have a large proportion of collections that are ex situ building components, so things like architectural carved stones and um, window glass that has either um, fallen away from the buildings we look after through historic decay or been purposely removed. And we've also got um, a large archaeology collection, both from modern and antiquarian excavations. And um, it's an object from this collection that is the focus of the project and the talk today. So in 2020, we were awarded £65,000 from the Arts and Humanities Research Council's Capability for Collections Fund. So this was a capital investment award for either the renovation of facilities or the upgrading of equipment. And we chose to use the funding to upgrade our heritage science equipment. So our conservation scientists were able to purchase a new portable XRF machine. And this is used to determine the elemental composition of materials. Our digital documentation team were able to purchase a new automated photogrammetry rig. And this is used for creating 3D models of our sites and our collections. In 2021, Arts and Humanities Research Council opened up applications for a follow-on scheme, and this was solely to support research and public engagement activities, which were linked to the equipment that had been purchased in the original funding. So the first step for us was to uh, agree which object or objects we would want to use as the focus of a project. Uh, it was important to us that the opportunity not only increased the understanding of the object, but also the physical access to it, and that it would give us an opportunity to reach out to new audiences. Um, this aligned with the purpose of the funding scheme to support engagement, and it also supported our own ambition to widen participation in Scotland's historic environment. So we kind of went back and forward. There was a few different kind of objects that we discussed, but what we um, decided on ultimately um, is an object that is unique in our collections and has perhaps been a little bit overlooked um, up until recently. And it, it's these, these three very, very tiny fragments of Islamic glass that you can see on the slide here. Um, these were found during archeological excavations at Old Calavrock Castle in Dumfries in the 1990s. Um, and when I say tiny, they really are tiny. So um, the, the piece in the middle and on the left actually fit together and when fitted together they're about the size of a ping pong ball. So really, really um, wee. Um, the other piece um, was found at a slightly different part of the site but um, visually looks the same as the other two pieces. 
So when these pieces were first found in the 90s, um, they were identified as Islamic based on the fact that they had an Arabic inscription on them. And um, this was translated as part of the word eternal. And it was suggested uh, that this could be an extract from the Quran. So it was also suggested that they could be from a uh, drinking vessel or a beaker, although I should say these are the only fragments that we have, so we, we don't have any other pieces of the object. Um, they were thought to originate from the Middle East and date to around the 12th or the 13th centuries. So we have absolutely no idea how an Islamic vessel would have ended up at a castle in Dumfries. And a couple of theories are that it could have been brought back as a result of trade, or it could be the property of returning crusaders. Although a number of complete and fragmentary Islamic drinking vessels are found in museum and private collections across the UK, as far as we're aware, these are the only fragments that have been found on an archaeological site in Scotland. Um, so sadly, like I say, a little bit overlooked, haven't um, come out of storage really since the, uh, the 1990s. And this is primarily due to a lack of display space at the castle. So this uh, project was the perfect opportunity for us to shine a new light on them and to find new ways of imagining uh, and understanding contemporary and historic links between Scotland and Islam. And it would also allow us to engage with a community that's not traditionally associated with the historic sites that we look after as an organisation. Uh, so needless to say, we were delighted when our application was successful. And the first phase of the project was to carry out the digital documentation and the scientific analysis of the glass. So our digital documentation team used photogrammetry to create a 3D model. Uh, and this is carried out by taking lots of overlapping photographs that are then sort of put through software and stitched together to create a, um, a 3D digital model. Um, the new equipment that they had purchased meant that they could predefine what images they wanted to take. And then there's a track and motors which angle the camera positions as needed. Um, and that significantly speeds up the process because up until this point, they'd had to do all that work manually. Uh, our conservation scientists were able to use the XRF machine to analyse the glass and learn more about the chemical elements that were present in it. So we, we knew from looking at the glass that there was blue and white enamel decoration and the um, XRF could tell us what chemical elements were used in that. But it also showed us that there had been red enamel present at one point and also a gold colouring and that would have been applied as a gilding. Methods for making glass have varied throughout time and this lets us determine when and where the glass is made based on its chemical composition. So we discovered that um, the chemical composition of our glass was soda, lime and silica glass, um, which is very typical for glass making in the Middle East in the 13th century. The origin of the soda in the glass gives us perhaps an extra clue of where it may have come from. Um, there's only two types of glass with this type of soda uh, and it's usually made from the ashes of plants or from a naturally occurring salt found in northern Egypt. Um, unfortunately, through XRF alone, we're unable to pinpoint further where the glass is from and the only way we could, we could do that is with destructive testing, which is obviously not really something that we want to do. So the second phase of the uh, project was to digitally recreate what our glass vessel may have originally looked like. And for this, we worked with Alice Martin. Um, so Alice is a contemporary artist and she has an interest in the relationship between artists and museums and the role of curation in how we perceive artefacts. And she's worked across a variety of um, different mediums, including 3D printing and um, sort of digital art. So we already knew that the um, Arabic inscription included part of the word eternal, but we didn't know what the rest of the inscription could have been. And um, fortuitously, the father of somebody on the project team happened to be a retired academic from the University of Granada in Spain. And he uh, specialised in Islamic law, women and gender studies and medieval Islam. And he was able to identify that um, the two fragments that fit together were probably from the, um, like the circumference of the beaker. So it would, there would have been an inscription that went all the way around. And that it was probably the middle of a full sentence. The word eternal had the word and sort of following it. So that would indicate that there was more text to follow. And his research showed that um, potential starts of sentences that were common to those types of inscriptions were the glory, the power, the sovereignty and the happiness. And he identified a potential end of the sentence as being prosperity. 
Um, so, of course, we'll, we'll never know for definite what the inscription on our vessel would have said, but this gave us a really good starting point for a digital reconstruction. So Alice, um, who you can see on the slide here, she worked with a um, archaeological glass specialist to identify other Islamic vessels from a similar period. Um, and combined with the scientific analysis, this gave us an idea of what colour the beakers may have been and what the decorations might have been. So we discovered that the fragments that we've got are um, typical of what was made in Egypt and Syria in the 13th century. Um, and a lot of these examples showed inscriptions in gold that had a red outline around them and they would be set against the blue background. And these were all colours that were found during the XRF analysis that we had carried out. Um, and a lot of the uh, examples that Alice found also were sort of flared at the top and they had this kind of like dome at the bottom of them. And that was something that happened during the glass making process. So um, there's no evidence from the free fragments that we have that there would have been any other type of decoration on the vessel. But during Alice's research, um, she came across uh, vessels that had a variety of decorations. And one particular theme that uh, came up several times were images of fish, so either sort of one fish by itself or a group of them. And apparently this was prominent towards the end of the 12th century. And it was a sign of eternal life and a good omen. So we discussed as a project team whether we should include this in our own digital reconstruction, um, even though there was kind of no evidence that our vessel would ever have kind of had that design on it. And we sort of agreed that it would be nice to have a bit of artistic license um, and to sort of experiment with this. So that's ultimately what we decided. So this slide just shows um, some of the kind of research and tools that um, led to the final design. And on the bottom left here, this is um, a screenshot from the photogrammetry of the larger shard of glass. So um, when you access this on our Sketchfab website, you can sort of rotate it and zoom in and out and get all the, the details of it. So this was the final um, digital design that Alice came up with of the reconstructed vessel. Um, so the inscription that you can see here reads eternal. So that's based on the fragment that we have. Um, but Alice also included inscriptions for glory and permanent prosperity around the band as well. And again, when you access this online with the 3D model, you're able to sort of spin it around to have a look at that. Um, as you can see, we included just the one fish. Um, and the reason for just the one is that we wanted it to complement the um, inscription and the decoration around the band rather than distract from it. Uh, the dimensions of the beaker are based on uh, comparative examples that Alice found during her research as well. So for the final phase of the project, we had our community engagement element. And for that, we worked with two groups, the Eighth Braid Salam Muslim Scouts, who are based in Edinburgh, and Amina Muslim Women's Resource Centre, who are based in Glasgow. Um, and the workshops that we delivered to both groups were sort of tailored based on their own needs. So for the Scout group, there were 70 of them with an age range of 6 to 16, and staff from across uh, Historic Environment Scotland delivered uh, two workshops at their weekly um, scout sessions. And this was followed by them undertaking a self-led visit to Stirling Castle. So although the, the glass fragments themselves are from Calavrock Castle, um, it was kind of evident fairly early on in the process that getting a group of 70 kids from Edinburgh to Dumfries and back in a day was gonna be a bit of a challenge. Um, so Stirling was identified as a great example of a medieval castle that would be a suitable alternative. So the first of the workshops with the scout session was a creative session and um, for this I started by bringing in the, the fragments of glass so they could actually have a look at them and they were all very very excited to see um, you know, the real thing. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to talk about um, archaeology, how the glass was discovered, how we care for it now, and um, you know, why they're important in the context of our collections and um, Scotland's history. Alice then explained to the group um, about her research processes, what she had discovered, and how that was helping her to come up with her 3D design. And she also had a, um, a 3D print of the sort of shape and um, size of the uh, vessel. So you can probably just see that on the bottom left there. And that was to give the group an idea of the size and um, size and shape of, of the beaker that she was working with. 
So she then ran a, um, an activity with the younger kids where they got to make a beaker shape out of pipe cleaners. And this is reminiscent of a 3D uh, model, so a bit like a wireframe visual. And um, we encouraged the kids to get creative with size, structure, color and spacing. And you can see some of the great um, examples that they made here. So we did provide um, sort of photographs of um, fragmentary and whole um, vessels. Uh, that they could use for inspiration if they wanted to, but um, a lot of them were really happy just to kind of throw in lots of colour and, and do their own thing. So for the older kids, our Equalities Manager Anila and Gaelic Officer Ian uh, ran a calligraphy and a collage activity. So for this, we selected uh, several of the 99 names of Allah, and these were designed onto worksheets in Arabic, English and Gaelic. And the groups could decorate these using coloured paper, and uh, that would help them create the collage. And they then had the opportunity to practise their own uh, calligraphy skills, which they all really enjoyed. So the following week, we ran our second workshop with the Scouts, and this time we were focusing on science and digital documentation. And as well as providing the group with an opportunity to learn more about the research that we were doing, we also wanted to use it to stimulate a discussion about careers in the heritage science sector. So to begin with, our Applied Conservation Manager, Clara, um, discussed the process of digital documentation and the different techniques that could be used, which included the photogrammetry that we had used as part of the process. Um, and we also provided the kids with digital cameras so that they could practice photographing objects from different angles, as would happen when you're digitally documenting an object. Um, for this, we encouraged the, the scouts to bring along items from home that they could photograph. And we got a really interesting mix of things like stuffed toys and golf balls. So lots of different like sizes and textures that we could sort of play around with and discuss some of the, um, the challenges that you can sometimes come across during digital documentation. So for the second part of, of the uh, heritage science session, um, our conservation scientist Maureen and archaeological science manager Lisa um, taught the kids about XRF analysis. Um, so for various um, kind of practical and legal reasons, we, we couldn't show them an XRF machine actually in process. So um, we talked them through how the process worked. Um, the, they uh, had an explanation of the periodic table and then they matched up the elements found uh, on the periodic table to the colours of the glass using um, this kind of like handmade illustration that had been blown up by Maureen of the two fragments slotted together, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and the, then we had what was probably my favourite part of the entire project. Um, to, to give the kids an idea of how an XRF machine works, we ran an interactive session where they basically acted out the role of an atom. So we had a stationary object on the ground that was the nucleus and uh, the kids were the electrons and they ran in circles around the nucleus. One of the kids was given uh, a soft ball and they were the XRF machine and they had to throw the ball at the electrons as they were running around uh, to try and displace them. And that was demonstrating how um, during the XRF process, the X-ray beam displaces electrons in atoms. Um, and if you're ever looking for a fun and interactive way to teach kids about XRF, I highly recommend this. Um, as you can imagine, them getting to throw balls at each other was a lot of good fun. Um, so the process that we took with the women's group from Amanet was very, very different. Um, it was a much smaller group, uh, about 10 women. Uh, they were all in the process of seeking asylum, all quite vulnerable and spoke uh, very little English. Um, and they used the, the project as an opportunity to undertake quite a lot of self-led sessions with their group leaders from Amana. And this started with a trip to um, Calavrock Castle, where the glass had been found. So the image on the screen here is, is old Calavrock Castle, where the fragments are from. Now, some of you might be familiar with um, the sort of beautiful red triangular castle with the moat around it as Calavrock. That's the new castle. So that was built um, about 50 years after this one, I think, which is a little bit closer towards the Solway Firth that um, had to be abandoned quite early into its um, existence. So similar to the, the Scout group, um, we ran a creative workshop for Amana and um, we agreed that we would limit the, the staff number who attended this event um, just so we didn't um, kind of leave the group feeling overwhelmed. And it was also agreed that it would only be female staff that took part. 
Um, the group had a translator working with them, um, but we did also provide some of the information about the glass that we'd found in Kurdish as well, so that they could have that to read and they, they didn't have to um, have, keep having things translated. Um, we, we took the glass fragments along, so again, you know, they had the opportunity to see the real thing. And then Alice um, went through the processes that she had, she had researched for her digital reconstruction. And they then got to um, paint their own um, 3D printed version of, of the beakers. Um, so again, we provided um, illustrations of some examples in different collections and they were free to use um, inspiration from that or just sort of do their own thing. And as you can see in the um, bottom right, we got a really nice um, kind of mix. Um, and I particularly like the one that included the fish that was very much discussed at the start of the project. Um, so even though there was a language barrier, it did become clear that um, the glass had prompted a lot of great discussion and debate amongst the women. And as the session went on, um, it was really nice to see them become more relaxed around the staff. And um, they became a lot more confident in prompting discussions with us in English. Um, and as, as is so often the case, um, you know, their English is actually really good. It, it was just a confidence issue about kind of engaging with us initially. Um, they taught us how to write our names in Kurdish, which was, was really nice. And some of them agreed to be photographed and filmed by their group leader from Amina, um, kind of talking about the project. And that was something that we'd actually ruled out quite early on because um, some of them had expressed concerns about appearing on camera. Um, so amongst the themes that this session sparked were discussions around politics, conflict, repatriation of cultural artifacts, um, connections, leaders versus ordinary people, and uncertainty. Um, as a self-led uh, follow-up activity, the, the group were asked to write a letter either to or from the glass, um, and in this they explored themes of family separation, homelands, and identity. Um, and I'm just gonna read out one of the letters that was written by one of the women. Hello. I am a glass fragment that you visited the other day. My name is Plate. To be honest, I don't know where I'm from. As a child, I was separated from my family and country, but from the markings on my body, I imagine I'm Arab. I am in Glasgow now. On one hand, I'm happy that scientists are trying to find my origins. On the other hand, they may never succeed. I have a feeling that pieces of my body are buried. Perhaps if they are found, it can be the beginning of finding me. So as the project began to wrap up, we started looking at creating a digital resource as a repository for where we could capture all of the research findings and experiences that had made up the project. And for this, our digital documentation team used the education technology platform ThingLink. Um, so we were able to pull all of our content together into this one online resource and this enables us to share the project with other people um, and if, if this were the live thing you would be able to click on various elements of this and it would take you to research reports, photographs, 3D models and videos. Um, so we received really great feedback from, from both groups who were involved in the project and some of the comments that we got um, included um, um, participants feeling that they had uh, found evidence between their religious and cultural heritage in Scotland and feeling that they had strengthened links to Scotland and had an opportunity to explore their own identities. Um, and for the, the women's group in particular, um, some of the feedback was around kind of finding a creative outlet for some of the trauma that they had experienced. We were really keen from the outset that um, engaging with the groups didn't end with this project. So this is just some of the ways that we're continuing to engage with both of the groups. Um, so the Scout group are shortly going to be undertaking a facilitated visit to um, Edinburgh Castle with our learning and inclusion team. Um, Amina celebrated Persian New Year at Stirling Castle in which uh, 75 women and children attended an event. Um, the women are also working on a digital exhibition about the project and we're now in the early stages of engaging um, with them about how they can feed into the future interpretation of a glass when it eventually goes on display at the castle. Um, and that's something that they specifically asked to be involved in during that creative workshop that we ran with them. So it's really nice that that's something that we're able to follow up on. Uh, so that's everything from me. Thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions.